My research area is in the general area of nanoscience, nanotechnology, applied to thermal management, heat transfer, energy conversion, and surface nanomanufacturing. Now, the reason why I'm in this field, well, it's a long story. First, the reason why I'm in mechanical engineering, well, the reason why I went to science is, uh, is because uh, most of the people in my generation go to science because they are good in math or in sciences, in physics or chemistry. It's not, there's, there's no reason why we go there. It's just because we're good at it. You know, there was people didn't tell us, okay, what are you going to be doing as a scientist or engineer? But we were good at it, so we go to science. Everybody tells us to go to science. So I went to uh, I went to, to high school uh, foc uh, focusing in sciences, and I went to college afterwards uh, majoring in mechanical engineering because I thought it was one of the majors that allowed me to do a lot of physics, and it's one of those fields that you you could learn a lot of things. You know, mechanical engineering, for example, has you know fluid mechanics. You, you know, you can work in aerodynamics. You can work in material science. So on. So that's the reason why I'm, I was really interested in mechanical engineering. Now, when I was done with my master's degree in mechanical engineering, I had to choose. Now I became more material. I could, you know, what do I really want to do? Uh, so I had a couple of options, and I decided to go into the field of nanoscience and nanotechnology because I I learned that uh, in order to really understand something, you know, you need to go to the basics of it, right? So it turns out that nanoscience and nanotechnology really answers most of the questions that we have in the macro scale. If you want to know why you, know, uh, you have aerodynamics, or if you want to know why the water flow in a certain matter, or if you want to know why something tastes a, a certain way, by uh, understanding the nanostructures, uh, the nanomaterial that's made it, up, that, that's, that it is made out of, then you'll be, you'll be able to answer this question. So it's more of a curiosity, being able to have a very good understanding of the world around us. And that's why I went to the field of nanosystems and microsystems. So what I'm working on right now, uh, I lead the research lab at the University of Nebraska, and our lab is called the Nano and Microsystem Research Lab. We work in a general area of um, energy conversion using solid state uh, methods, such as thermal photovoltaics and thermal electrics. Also, we work on thermal management of high, high heat flux microelectronics, and what I mean by that is uh, we're trying to find out how to cool electronics. And the conventional way of doing it in general is just to put a heat sink on top of your microchip and then you use flow or some other liquid to cool it. And in my lab, what we're trying to do is to understand where, where the heat comes from and how do we f solve that problem within the microsystem itself. So that means we need to design heat sinks, you know, microcoolers that are on the same scale as the microprocessors. So that requires a lot of physics. Uh, beside the engineering application, uh, there comes, there's also the basic knowledge that we get out of it too. Because it turns out when you go to a micro nano scale, the physics that we learn uh, in a macro scale, in, you know, when you're in high school, in early college, it's not true. It doesn't apply anymore. So we need to now really start to learn new physics and try to understand and develop new concepts and theories. And so those, those are the two areas that I work on. And recently, we, not actually recent, but in the past four years, we've been working on developing what's called the thermal logic devices and thermal uh, rectifiers. And this topic comes about a problem that was posed to me by a colleague of mine at JPL, at NASA JPL. They're interested in uh, exploring Venus. However, the temperature of the Venus is relatively high. It's about 400 degrees C. The pressure is very high. And there are radiation and other factors that you know, makes it very difficult to explore. And in order to explore any planet, one needs to have recording mechanisms, something you could use to record you know, or, or sensors. And those typically are based on electronics. And as we know today, uh, electronics do not work at those high temperatures. So we, we had to come up with other solution. So the problem was you know, posed. And a lot of researchers were working on finding new materials that could sustain high temperatures. Others are looking for ways to avoid electronic at all. So in my group, we decided to take a totally different approach, which is to use heat itself. And the reason is because we are already familiar with heat. We do a lot of work in heat transfer, thermal management. So we thought, OK, if heat is just a, a you know, flow, of a flow of electron, flow of photons, flow of photons, which is just energy carriers, which is the same as uh, electricity, then why can't we use heat itself to do and computing, okay? So we start working on this project. You know, at the beginning, we start uh, looking at the theory, trying to find ways to, we could control heat, which is quite difficult. But at the end of the day, we were able to develop what's called the thermal memory device, a memory device that works entirely on heat. The one and zeros are actually high and low temperatures, and it works perfectly. And the next step was, okay, we need to actually prototype, design and make a prototype for that. And so we, we spent a couple more years uh, working on it. And in this case, we specifically focused on what's called thermal rectifier. So we could rectify heat. We could change the direction of heat, which is not generally intuitive, but uh, we thought we could do it. And we were able to do it, in fact. So we come up with the theory behind it, uh, the model we did, and then we actually went and fabricate the device. All this is done at the micro scale, uh, because the te underlying technology works only uh, at that scale. 
which is uh, the when separation distance between terminals that we're interested in are below one micron. So these are a couple of the projects we work on. Uh, I have a couple of other students who work on uh, energy, conserva uh, energy storage, which is a big problem. Uh, in fact, it is says that if you could uh, store heat, then you solve a lot of problems. And one particular example is solar energy that we get uh, every day. And one of the challenges is that at night we can't get the solar energy anymore, so we have to find ways to store it. Right? And the current state of the art, uh, tools that we're using to store energy are not very well. Uh, they do not work as good as we would like them to work. And it's generally because they have very relatively low thermal conductivity. So in my lab, we're uh, developing new technologies. Uh, we call them thermal batteries. So really what we want to do at the end of the day is have a battery that you could turn on and off, where instead of having electricity coming, in, coming off or in, it will be heat. So this such thing doesn't exist at this today. And we believe we could do it, and we're using uh, certain things that I probably cannot speak of right now on camera, but uh, it consists of surface nano engineering. So we could pattern surfaces, and then we could use what's called liquid metals. And the interaction between the liquid metal and the pattern surfaces allows us to do have thermal, thermal rectification, whereby we could control the flow of heat in and out of our thermal battery. I run this program called Senecol, and the idea came when I was in grad school. So I, I went to RPI and I was doing my grad school and I've, it wasn't the easiest thing ever. And I started to realize that you know, some of the challenges we get as African uh, has to do to the perspective that people get have about us. You know, I think uh, when you think of an African anywhere, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is he's probably asking for money or you know, it's, there's, uh, there are diseases in his country or you know, that stereotype that everybody knows about, right? Whereas it's not the same for an Asian, right? I mean, an Asian who comes, he could be uh, from, uh, not in the sciences, but he just needs to wear glasses, and then he's probably way better a scientist. He's already a better scientist than an African who's probably top of his class. So there's a stereotype that, you know, affects us all in the West. Okay, so I, I thought that the only way we could solve that problem is to actually uh, go back to the source of the problem, which is, you know, Africa itself. You know, we need to uh, have a strong Africa, and the way to make it strong is through our human resources. And one way we could exploit the human resources education, and we certainly believe that STEM education is at the foremost of this, you know, this, this drive towards, you know, having a good education in our continent. So I decided to um, create this organization, and the goal was to promote STEM education through means that are known already to the, you know, other countries, such as robotics competition, design competition, and things of that sort. So it has grown since then. I, I finished my. Uh, PhD, then did a postdoc, then went to uh, ran, ran to uh, UNL, University of Nebraska Lincoln, where I'm currently a professor. And during during this period, when I was a PhD and a postdoc, I was actually using my own money to run this program. And as a postdoc, a PhD, you know, have really a lot of money. So, but I was able to manage. But fortunately enough, I went to Nebraska, and I have spoken with my uh, department chair, and I told him about what I'm doing, and I told him that I was using my own funding. I told him, now, can I use some of my research funding, a little bit of it, you know, to, do, to run some of these activities. He was very supportive of it. And not only that, he was able to, you know, provide extra funding to do, uh, to do our program. So as a result of that, we've grown a lot. So now we have three programs within the organization, within Senecal. We have uh, the most important one, uh, at least the biggest one, is the Pan-African Robotics Competition, which is a competition uh, that's an, it's an all-African robotics competition, which brings together high school, middle school, and university college teams, uh, university teams across the continent to compete on a robotics challenge around a team that's relevant to the sustainable development of the continent. For example, um, in 2016, the team was uh, powering agriculture. How do we use you know, science, engineering, ro robotics, drones, automation to empower or to have a better agricultural system? Uh, this year, the topic was made in Africa. And the goal was, how do we make, it, how do we make uh, the, the kids or the youth understand the importance of product development? the importance of industrialization and the importance of innovation. In order to have a continent that's going to, be, uh, that's going to rise, we need to not only do service, but we need to produce too. We need to, be, we need to check that market. You know, we are a producer of products. You know? So this is something very important. And so within those teams, the kids would make robot. They, they would build robots. They would make project presentation. And, and then what, we, what they get out of it at the end of the day, besides the technical skill they learn, is the self-esteem, that they know that scientists they could do it, you know, that the movie that they see, whether it's, you know, 
you know, transformer that is not magic, but it's actually just you know basic science and you know engineering. And so this this helps them actually go forward in their life and believe in themselves. And then we help them also. We try to channel them to go into science as well by by this. And beside that, uh, the other benefit of the program is we, we make science fun you know so we're not going into classroom and just you know drawing you know mechanism or you know writing equation now it's they are in a stadium you know there are people shouting screaming laughing you know you know supporting them and they are having fun you know with this robot you know and they they mix together they learn from each other they learn about their different uh, classmates they learn about others from other countries which is very important especially in the context of Africa and where we need to be really united and work together you know so this is the pan african robotics competition uh, along with that we had created programs that are more or less supporting this whole idea and one of them is the azibat robot kit uh, we realized that has we one of has we go ahead and promotes STEM education, one thing that always comes to mind is where do we get the kit, where do we get the robots, where do we get this equipment to do all this fancy science. So we decided that why can't we build it ourselves, why can't we actually make this kit and then make it available to, to them. So we've designed uh, the Azibat robot kit, which is a robot. Uh, this, this has the same state of the art technology as any other robot that you would find in the market. And we've made the robot open source, that means all the equipment, all the materials the knowledge that's needed to make the robot is available online, it's 3D printable, the electronics are also open source. So this is pretty much our organization and we keep growing. Uh, the past two years we were in Senegal, this year we are in Rwanda. Uh, I mean in 2018 rather, we will be in Rwanda for the Pan-African Robotics Competition. We expect to have over 20 countries across the continent. Uh, beside the, the, our work we do with the Pan-African Robotics Competition and the various uh, robot kits that we're developing, we also recently opened a university called Dakar, American University of Science and Technology. Uh, we believe that we were doing fine with working with these kids and you know, inspiring them, but it turns out it wasn't enough. We need to actually follow up with the students and following up, we need to keep them with the same high standard of learning uh, and innovation. So we decided to open this university to provide those services. Uh, a lot of schools, a lot of universities in Africa, which I do not know all of them, but many of them do not emphasize practical science. You know, you learn a lot of theory, you're really good at math and physics, but if you are given, you know, a simple problem as far as, you know, fixing something, it becomes a problem, you know. And we don't need to name examples, but we've seen many in more than one cases where our countries have, you know, really basic small problems and they, we outsource them to, to the West. So that means our engineers are not being trained the right way. And this is not a general, just a general statement, not, a specific, not necessarily true to it. all cases. So the purpose then of our university is to fill that gap, which is to provide high standard, you know, practical hands-on engineering to our African students. So we started the, in, in January 2017 and had a couple of students. Uh, right now we are, we're starting the fall of 2017, with, we expect to have about 60 students. And our students live on campus, uh, they eat on campus, and the campus is located in a city called Somon in Senegal. What I'm more interested in is really how uh, the knowledge that I've acquired, how the, this program uh, that we've started will impact, you know, the African community, really. So all the work that we've been doing, do we see the results? You know, are we getting engineers that are very strong fundamentally, but also very, have very practical skills and that are commercial? commercial they, are, they, they are marketable. They could go out in the market and get jobs. I think that's really what I, uh, I would be very satisfied, very fulfilled if we were able to achieve this. And, and uh, of course the ultimate goal is not to get engineering scientists, but also engineering scientists who could solve the societal needs of Africa, so we don't have this problem anymore. I want to be able to go to you know, uh, the West and people will see me and think I'm a you know, quantum physicist. If I'm not, but just because you know, there's so many quantum physicists in uh, Africa, or because we've been doing so great, you know, we've been doing, inventing things, everybody thinks that I'm smart. You know? And not look at me as just another guy who was, who was just, you know, took the ocean and just emigrated, you know, migrated to Europe.